Great, so um, I guess it's, uh, let me get started. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, joining the session, uh, during which we're gonna cover everything you ever wanted to know about uh, garbage collection in Java and how it applies to Apache Cassandra. Uh, so to go into more details, uh, also I'm gonna start with an overview of uh, Java garbage collection. Uh, what is it? Why does it happen? Why is it important? What you need to know about? And then different garbage collectors. Um, and then dive into specifically how GC affects Cassandra. Uh, the different components of Cassandra that create garbage collection, and then how do you address them, right? It's nice to know you have problems, but it's even better to know uh, what you can do about them. And then uh, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, it's nice to see everybody from Data Stacks again. Uh, I was an SC, a sales engineer at Data Stacks for over five years, uh, helping companies uh, learn about the technology, what is Cassandra, implement it, uh, review data model, tuning, configuration, et cetera. And then more recently, I joined Azul. Uh, Azul provides a high performance um, garbage collector that avoids stops or pauses. So lately, I've been working more with low latency trading application. And I always thought Cassandra at latency was incredibly fast, but now I'm talking about like nanosecond latencies. Uh, but, you know, luckily, you know, people are using Zing on Cassandra, uh, Hadoop Node, Elastic, Solar, so basically anything that runs on the JVM uh, can run on Zing. So my world is basically more or less Cassandra and garbage collection. Uh, so let's talk about uh, garbage collection in Java. Uh, let's start with a brief history of Java. Uh, Java 1.0 came out in 1996. Um, it feels like 100 years ago. I mean, after the year we've just had, it feels like ages. I don't know if anybody can remember what they were doing in 96. Um, the next, you know, the next major release was four years later. And then uh, Java 7 uh, came out in 2011, right? So there was quite some time. There's still definitely people using Java 7. Most people are um, using uh, Java 8, which is a long-term support, meaning like it's supported for at least 10 plus years. Uh, the next long-term supported version is um, uh, Java 11. Uh, thanks for everybody sharing what they were doing in 1996. <laughs> uh, and then the next uh, long-term supported version is coming out. It, right now it's targeted for September of 2000. Uh, 21, so next year, right? So you could see the evolution. I mean, there's definitely been a lot more activity in the Java world over the last few years. So now, you know, what is garbage collection, right? Like, what is it exactly? Uh, so garbage collection is a way for the Java virtual machine, the JVM, to free up memory, right? So any objects that aren't being used that's unreachable, well, that that should get freed up so other objects can get created and can be used and use that memory space. And so there's two types of garbage collection. There's a uh, minor garbage collection, which is, uh, you know, most objects are gonna be created and then they're gonna be uh, unreachable within uh, the first garbage collection cycle. Uh, and then you have a major and full GC, which is a lot more, uh, I don't want to say relevant, but that's what people notice because that's usually impacts the application. And uh, at the bottom, we, uh, the picture basically depicts um, a traditional generational garbage collector like CMS. Uh, CMS used to be the default in, in Java and with Cassandra. Um, you know, you start with Eden, uh, survival of space zero and one, and that makes up your young uh, generation. And then uh, as objects get promoted, they um, 
they're looking, you know, they get promoted to tenured and then permanent. And then when you do a full GC is when those objects are removed. Um, so, you know, why does garbage collection even happen? Um, so it's based on the premise that most objects in Java are short-lived. Uh, what it means is that they're not gonna survive that first garbage collection cycle. Uh, they're created and, uh, and reference fairly quickly. And so you, you need a way to, to clear up the, the heap, to free up memories. You don't want to run out of uh, memory. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, to add to the premise is that um, when you cleaning up new, new generation, you know, Eden survivors phase zero one, it's really fast. Promoting from young to old is slower. Um, the more objects you create, uh, you're, the more your young generation is going to get full and then it's going to get promoted to old. And these promotions also means longer pauses. So this is all these uh, items, all these objects affect uh, your garbage collection and your pauses. And so the, the diagram at the bottom is actually a representation of G1, which is garbage first, which is um, the now the default garbage collector in from, I think like Java nine onwards and with Cassandra. And it's similar to CMS in terms of it's still generational. You still have your Eden, your survivor space, uh, your old gen. Uh, but what it does is it takes, instead of taking the entire heap and breaking it up into the section, it actually takes your entire heap, breaks it up into smaller regions, uh, usually you know divided by uh, 2048. Uh, and so it means that when it's actually doing garbage collection, it's doing garbage collection on smaller, um, smaller regions, smaller heap sizes, and so it's a lot more efficient. And so, you know, why is there garbage collection happening even to begin with? Well, I mean, that's also the reason why people are using Java instead of C++, right? it's just a lot easier from a developer standpoint where you don't have to worry about releasing memory. Uh, you don't have to, to do it manually. It's done for you in Java through garbage collection. Uh, garbage collection is a way of allocating objects on heap and then on the flip side, clearing up the memory so that uh, you have memory available to create future objects. Um, it's also a way of making sure that you're not overriding the content of an object. Uh, for example, let's say you, you create an object and then you have a, you know, another part of the application that creates a pointer to that object. Uh, and then let's say you clean up the object, but you didn't clean up the pointer. And then you, you use that space to create a new object. So now that pointer is pointing to something that it didn't even, you know, completely different. Uh, and it's, this is a, a that type of situation is actually really, really hard to debug. So it just makes it makes programming a lot easier. It makes debugging a lot easier. Um, but then, you know, keep in mind that uh, the more garbage collection activity there is, the more resources it's going to use, and it's not just on you know in terms of memory, but it's also uh, on your CPU, right? And then. Um, the one thing you really, really should pay attention to with garbage collection is these stop the world pauses. So I'm sure everybody's seen their Cassandra environment. Um, you know, sometimes the stability and the smoothness isn't there. Um, for example, you know, imagine if you're, so when you do a stop the world pause, it actually stops the application for running. And so let's say you have a one second garbage collection pause, which, you know, it's, fairly big for garbage collection, but you know, in Cassandra, I've actually seen worse pauses. Well, during that time, Cassandra can't uh, handle writes or reads, right? So think about you're doing a million writes per second and you have a million pause, then all of a sudden your coordinator has to handle uh, you know, all the head to handoffs and, uh, and then has to replay all that information to the replicas or the replica that was uh, experiencing a stop the world pause. So it's just additional work um, on your cluster when you're having these stop the world pauses. And so just you know a little bit of terminology. Uh, I just mentioned you know generations, uh, generational garbage collectors like CMS, like G1, uh, Zing is another one. 
uh, it's a, you know, going back to that premise that most objects will not survive the first GC cycle. And so they get created and cleaned up fairly quickly. So, you know, you have one garbage collector that actually is monitoring these objects versus another one that's actually tracking um, objects that are promoted to the old generation. Uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, some of the newer garbage collectors like Shenandoah and, by Red Hat and ZGC by uh, Oracle, uh, those are single generation, right? They don't differentiate, they don't keep track of young and old. So that's, you know, just different. Um, parallel, uh, most uh, more modern gen uh, garbage collectors are parallel, meaning they're running, you know, multiple threads simultaneously as opposed to, to serial. I mean, serial is more, you know, older garbage collectors where let's say you're running an application from a command line and it's smaller. Um, it, your garbage collection is just executed in just one GC thread. Uh, but most garbage collectors now uh, run in parallel. And uh, they also run, you'll hear they run concurrently because they're running concurrently with the application. Um, and so the, the last terminology is actually two different methodology of how garbage collection per se is done. Uh, mark and sweep, you know, CMS, uh, concurrent mark and sweep, uh, the name says it all. Uh, the way it works is that it will start at the root and, and it'll traverse your heap and identify and basically mark objects, which one are reachable, which one are unreachable. And, uh, and then it'll do a, sw a sweeping phase where anything that was marked as unreachable gets cleared up versus mark and copy, which is, uh, you know, the methodology for, this, you know, uh, Shenandoah, ZGC, Zing, uh, they all do mark and copy where instead of just marking first and then sweeping, uh, it will mark and when it finds an object reachable, then it will copy it to a different uh, memory space. Uh, and this is a little bit more complicated because then if you have other objects referencing that, that object, you know, the new pointers, the pointers need to point to the new location, uh, but it's just a lot more efficient and more performant. And so now you're probably thinking, oh, I should have paid attention to what all these garbage collectors were and which one did what. Uh, just kidding. Uh, this is just a summary of the different garbage collectors you have out there. And I mean, there's quite a few. Uh, you know, Parallel is kind of the beginning. Uh, CMS was the default. G1 is now the default. Uh, it's a lot easier to use, a lot less tuning. Uh, ZGC Shenandoah came out recently. Uh, they're single generation, concurrent, parallel garbage collector. Zing is also concurrent uh, copy, uh, mark and copy garbage collector that avoids stop the wall pauses. Uh, and then Epsilon, I'll mention it here, but you probably won't see it in Cassandra because uh, Epsilon is great if you have zero GC. So let's say, you know, some of these low latency training systems I work with, uh, they might use Epsilon, but as soon as you hit a garbage collection, uh, the application will probably crash. So, um, so yeah, so there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of options with garbage collectors. Um, and then just, you know, a little bit of history on, I'm just gonna, just G1, right? Uh, G1 has been around for quite a while. It uh, came out in, it was first experimental in Java 6 in uh, 2009. Uh, it became supported in Java 7. Uh, a couple of years later, it became supported along CMS. It was promoted, so it's now in Java 8. And actually as of Java 9, I didn't put it in there, so I put it in 11. Uh, it actually replaces, if you're using Hotspot, it actually replaces um, the garbage collector uh, before it used to be CMS. That was the default, now it's G1. Uh, and then it's also to you know, illustrate that garbage collection is hard, right? Like it takes a while for a garbage collector to be efficient, to be tested, uh, to work out some of the details, right? Like this one, it took about nine years between the time it was first released to the time it became the default. So, um, and then 
my last point on garbage collection per se specifically is like this is all the different tuning parameters and flags that um, you can use with CMS, right? So CMS is fairly, you know, very powerful, but took a lot of time and resources tuning it correctly. Uh, G1, it takes a lot fewer flags. You, know, you still want to set your max heap, maybe your minimum heap size, uh, the number of uh, max pause time and uh, concurrent compact, uh, compactors. But um, as new garbage collectors come out, they tend to also try to move towards like ease of use in terms of tuning. For example, you know, like C4 is a garbage collector in Zing, and you only really need to set the XMX the max heap size, and that's it. So, um, I mean, kind of the same way Cassandra has been trying to ease ease of use in terms of you know using and operating and developing on Cassandra. Same thing with garbage collectors. And then my last point is, don't just switch your garbage collector and not change your flags because uh, if you know, especially if you're changing to something like Shenandoah, ZGC, uh, single generation, tune it correctly, right? Don't just change it. Uh, take a look at your flags. So now, you know, let's talk about uh, garbage collection uh, for Apache Cassandra specifically. So the first topic I'm going to address is compaction. Uh, quick recap, uh, compaction, uh, let me go through, you know, the write path. Uh, when Cassandra writes data, it will write to a on-disk journal entry called the commit log as well as an in-memory uh, data structure called the mem table. This way, if you're rebooting your server, you know everything that's in memory gets wiped out, but then you can replay all your entry from the commit log and you don't lose any data, which is kind of nice when you have a database. Uh, as you know, you write more and more data, your commit log, your mem tables get full, and then the mem tables get flushed onto disk into SS tables. And then you know the more you do this, the more you're gonna have SS tables, and then compaction takes all these SS tables, combine them into one. So, so compassion is great in terms of, of disk space, right? Uh, also, it's you know a very efficient way of clear up uh, on these SS tables, relying on disk, and then combining your records that you might have updated over time into just the, you know, based on the one uh, primary key. The thing is, compaction actually creates a lot of very you know short-lived objects, and so you know the more short-lived objects you have, they get promoted and they create garbage collection. So a lot of times when you see a lot of compactions happening, you'll probably also notice that your, your cluster, your nodes are also going through a lot of, they might be going through a lot of GC pauses. Um, the next topic is tombstones. So uh, can't get away from the right path. Um, you know, like I mentioned, commit log, mem table to write a, a record. When you're deleting data in Cassandra, uh, it doesn't go through your terabytes of data, find the record, and then deletes it. It actually, you know, inserts a new record. Uh, it will uh, insert the primary key, uh, puts a flag called a tombstone, and so when you're uh, reading data, it will know that that record is marked for deletion. Will include it into um, into your result set as well as um, when you're running compaction, you know um, it'll compact the data, but the data isn't actually deleted right when compaction happens. It will wait until GC gray seconds is over, uh, so you don't have phantom records uh, coming back in case replicas were offline or out of sync, right? And so the thing is, um, if you're if you're writing a lot of tombstones and you're retrieving large result sets. Uh, the thing is that uh, the tombstones are actually kept in memories because a coordinator needs to know which records uh, are marked for deletion, you know, especially if you're pulling from multiple replicas, as you should be with a consistency level of local quorum, hopefully. Uh, and so it means that you know, on, your, on your queries, uh, the coordinator can't leverage paging. And so all these records need to be returned and they all you know, are read into memory and it creates memory pressure onto your nodes, especially on the coordinator. Um, the next, so I just mentioned compaction, um, tombstones, now mem table. So I know I mentioned mem table already because you can't talk about the, the write path or even the read path without mem table, but they're you know, in memory data structure. Um, 
what you should keep in mind is that uh, for every table you create in Cassandra, it creates a mem table. And so if you think about best practices in Cassandra data modeling is you're supposed to take your access patterns and then build your tables based on how you're filtering your data. So if you're doing, um, uh, let's say you have a table for account information and you want to you know, filter by email, or by phone number, or by account number, right? There's multiple ways of pulling information. Well, you know, best practices says you should actually have three different tables partitioned differently because then you're pulling based on the partition key. But now you all of a sudden, you know, you now have three mem tables for that one representation of data. And I've seen customers who had hundreds, hundreds of of tables in their Cassandra cluster. And it's, you know, it's the evolution of as your data model grows, as your application grow, as you start you using your Cassandra clusters for more and more use cases, you're gonna end up with um, with more, more tables in Cassandra, which also means more mem table. And so mem table takes up space in memory. Uh, the default is a quarter of your heap is allocated towards your mem tables. So keep that in mind. And then of course, you know, when mem tables get flushed onto disk, uh, it creates objects and it also triggers uh, garbage collection. So the more mem tables you have, the more they flush to disk, uh, the more uh, garbage collection you're gonna occur. Um, and then the last topic is white partitions, right? Um, you create your table, you have your primary key, your primary key is made up of your partition key and your clustering columns. You know, Cassandra is a distributed hash map. It's based on that partition key. It'll take that value, hashes it, and then it knows which data, which which node uh, has a copy of that data. Uh, and then your clustering columns make that more unique. Um, so for example, you're keeping track of market data. So you might have a table that's um, market data by ticker symbol. And so your partition key might be the ticker and then your clustering column might be the timestamp. And you're collecting inf information, let's say every second. Uh, and then as you start collecting more and more data, well, that partition is unbounded, right? It can go infinitely big. Um, this is small, you know, it's just one, one data set, but you know, in a more realistic use case, you're gonna have multiple columns. And so it's a lot more data uh, in your partition. And so, you know, again, um, when you're reading your partition, you're gonna be, you know, when you're reading your result set, you're gonna be reading that into memory. Um, best practice says what, like 100 meg. Uh, I know with newer versions of Cassandra, especially up to 3.6, uh, you can have wider partitions. Uh, I don't know enough about uh, 4.0, but maybe hopefully they've done something where you can have even wider partitions. Cause I've seen like, two gig partitions, if not bigger, add customers, right? So, so think about that, like, right, you're reading a partition and then you're uh, reading your, your two gigs into memory, you're creating all these objects um, and then you're creating garbage collection, uh, which impacts, of course, your performance and could actually trigger um, nodes to go offline and hopefully not cascading failure because you're not at that point yet because you're, watching this presentation and you'll know what to do. Um, so, you know, like, it's not the end of the world. Like, this is not, um, it's it's not that bad, right? There's, there's ways you can uh, address garbage collection in Cassandra. Uh, so let's go back to the first topic of compaction. Um, so first, make sure you pick the right compaction strategy for your use case, right? Default is size to your compaction. If you have a, a read heavy use case, use level compaction. You'll have bigger but fewer SS tables, right? And so you won't be compacting as much and so you won't be triggering garbage collection. If you have time windows, you know, time series data where you're updating it on a ongoing rolling forward basis, well, you don't need to compact all the old data, just compact what you need to, right? So that's also gonna help with garbage collection. And then tune it. Um, change, you know, throttle your compaction throughput, uh, lower the number of concurrent compactors if you need to, right? There's, uh, you know, a ton of levers in Cassandra. So make sure you're using them if you're seeing issues with compaction. 
you know, I mentioned in the, you know, when I was talking about white partition, that white partition also impacts compaction, right? So a, a lot of all these different components are all interrelated with Cassandra. So keep in mind, what is your partition size? Make sure they don't grow too big. Um, and then the last one is, uh, I should put cautiously in bold and not in parentheses, but um, increase your heap, right? Uh, but I say cautiously because the bigger your heap size, depending on what garbage collector you're using, uh, the longer your stop the wall pauses could be, right? Because especially if it's, um, if it's actually doing garbage collection on the entire heap each time, like some of the uh, single generational garbage collectors, uh, it's going to take more time to complete, right? It's also why, like, this is, uh, I took it from Datastack's website. They have a recommendation, you know, this is for uh, Cassandra 3, but they also have it for DSE. Um, CMS, we, you know, recommendation for smaller heap sizes. G1, you know, you can have a bigger heap size. Uh, garbage collector like Zing. Uh, the heap size is actually not proportional to stop the world pauses, so it can actually handle, you know, significantly, like actually up to like 20 terabyte heap sizes. So there you can uh, increase it, but, but I mean, make sure you're testing, right? Uh, make sure you don't just increase your heap size without paying attention to what else is going on in your environment. And make sure when you're testing, you're actually uh, hitting garbage collection so you can see how long your pauses are. So second topic was Tombstone. So, um, okay, so sorry, probably not the, the most popular thing to say on a Cassandra track, but if your application is generating a lot of Tombstones, just, just make sure that you're picking the right technology for your use case, right? There's no point in trying to fit you know, a bad fit uh, into a, because Cassandra is like a great technology, it's powerful. Uh, but if you need, you know, let's say you need scalability and high availability and you are generating uh, tombstones, well, there's things you can do. Uh, so first of all, check what is what is creating tombstones. Uh, the most obvious is, of course, if you have delete statements, but also if you have TTL, right? Time to live on your table, on your row, on your partition, it will create a tombstone. Uh, also inserting nulls into columns, right? With Cassandra, uh, you need to provide all the columns from your partition keys, but the other columns, it's efficient in terms of disk space, right? You don't have to insert nulls for those columns. So, uh, you know, make sure you're not inserting nulls for no reason. And then also if you're using collections, right? Um, if you're inserting or updating part of a collection, you could actually be creating a tombstone as well. So just keep in mind. Um, and then, you know, take a look at your queries. Um, Technically, I mean, best practice, you should be hitting a partition, uh, but I've seen a lot of customers, people using, let's say like a range query, like an in, right? Like a select columns from key space dot table where your partition key is in and then list a whole bunch of columns, right? Uh, or allow filtering. Uh, allow filtering is there to basically remind you that this is probably a bad idea at scale. It probably work on your computer, but not with uh, in a production environment. So just review your queries. Uh, and then mem tables. And I just want to highlight that, you know, some of these recommendations are, you know, tuning your garbage collector, uh, increasing your heap, but a lot of them are actually, you know, not even related to garbage collection per se, but actually what creates garbage collection, right? So it's not just the garbage collector. So mem table, um, right? You can tune your mem table. Uh, you don't have to use the default one quarter heap space for your mem table. If you using a garbage collector where you can have a larger heap, then you know give more heap sp size uh, space to your mem table, and it will let you have more Cassandra table. Uh, it's maybe more of a band aid than the you know best approach, but you know there's real life too, right? Uh, you can specify some of your tables to be off heap. For example, if you're storing blobs, you know, large text fields, probably not what you really want to do in Cassandra. You probably want to store that somewhere else and then have a pointer to it. But uh, that could be a, a use case for off heap table. Um, 
and then you know maybe separate your cluster right uh, i've seen that where uh, as your cl cluster grows and you start adding more and more tables uh, you'll see that not only you don't need all these tables to be part of the same cluster but there are different workloads you know maybe some of them are you know heavy early morning data loads versus uh, hourly audit query uh, jobs, right? And so all of a sudden your query, your audit job is going to fail because it's in the middle of that heavy, uh, unusually heavy morning load. And that could also be a good, uh, a good fit for separating your cluster. And then, I mean, I guess you can't go wrong with uh, increasing your heap size. Again, the caveats of uh, uh, do it cautiously. Uh, so compaction, tombstones, uh, mem table, wide partition. Uh, so I know it's easy for anybody to just tell you, hey, take a look at your data model. You might want to create a different table, have a smaller partition. Uh, you know, realistically, I know you have terabytes of data, you have application production, you the amount of regression testing it's going to take. It's it's not as simple as just saying, hey, change your your partition key. But um, you know, uh, unfortunately, if you have a really wide partition, uh, you know, maybe the partition was correct in the beginning, right? And then your use case evolved. You let's say you you had a huge client. Let's say Amazon decides to be one of your client, and next thing you know, it blows through your partition, right? So review your your partition and your data model. Um, another one is upgrade Cassandra. And so I, I, you know, I put in here in white partition because there's definitely been significant improvements in, in partition sizes with later versions of Cassandra, but that's true across, um, all the other, you know, uh, compaction and mem table usage and everything else in Cassandra. So usually later versions of Cassandra, you know, if you're still on a 2.2 version, you might want to get to at least the 3, 3.11. Um, and then, of course, increase your heap size. That's always, uh, will let you, you know, ultimately you can actually have wider rows, have read them into memory, it'll help with compaction, but then you might experience longer pauses. So grain of salt. Uh, and then, you know, the fifth a, a recommendation or option is there's a lot of garbage collectors out there now, right? Before it was CMS, G1, now you also have uh, Shenandoah, ZGC, Zing. Um, so take a look at different garbage collectors. Um, which one is the right one? Uh, people are probably not going to start switching to CMS uh, because it took a lot of time and resources to tune. Do you really want to be spending that time tuning your garbage collector when you could be doing something maybe a little bit more interesting? Um, Different garbage collectors, you know, whether they are single generation, uh, generational, uh, they handle the way they clean up memory, they do it differently, right? So some uh, can handle larger heaps without actually impacting uh, stop the world pauses. Um, when I say, uh, you know, go to the latest release, I am not saying, hey, go from Java 8 to Java 11. I mean, that's, that's a huge change. But if you're on Java 8, get to the latest version of Java 8. Uh, for one, the most obvious reason of security, but then also there's performance improvement in all these versions of Java. So you'll get uh, performance improvements just by upgrading your garbage collector. And then, you know, think about, I know everybody wants, you know, low latency and fast throughput. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of a trade-off. So something like maybe like Shenandoah, CGC, a single generation might be great for latency. Uh, CMS is, you know, great for throughput. Uh, Zing is, you know, actually can handle latency and throughput uh, fairly well, and so does G1. So, you know, so something, something to think about. And then test long enough. I mean, um, don't just test for five minutes, right? Don't just do Cassandra stress, write a million record, and it's over in like a minute, maybe even less than that. Uh, in production, Cassandra is going to be running for a long time. 
test your system like you would in production, especially if you're testing a different garbage collector. You want it to go through several rounds of GC cycles. Um, also, you know, most Java applications take a little bit of time for warm-up, right? Um, your first couple of writes won't be as fast as your thousandth write with Java if you had just restarted your Cassandra node. So keep that in mind. Maybe when you're doing, you know, benchmarking, performance testing, um, you know, forget the first few minutes unless warm up is important for you. Um, but you know, ultimately, you should have Cassandra running ideally a long time, and so make sure you're running Cassandra and your tests long enough. Um, and then let me leave you with some final thoughts. So one is, you know, I went through, uh, there's a lot of tuning you can do, whether it's for compaction, for mem tables, right? Uh, and I mean, these are just two very specific, uh, but there's a lot more tuning you can do. Um, and then also not just tune for your current work, like for your initial workload, but also keep tuning as your workload changes as your, your use case changes, evolves, as your data gets bigger. Um, okay, so I had to stick this one in there too. Increase your heap size. I feel like um, it's, it's not a Band-Aid because it, it is, a, you know, sometimes having a bigger heap actually helps. Um, just make sure that when you're increasing your heap size, again, you're not impacting your stop the world pauses, especially like, especially with G1. Um, also something to think about is, you know, you might want to stay at 31 gig heap, uh, because at 32, you're going to hit compressed oops. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, I mentioned, you know, test long enough with garbage collectors. Well, you know, same thing with Cassandra. And um, I mean, you're, especially your data model, right? You're not going to know if you have a white partition until you start ingesting real, real world data. Uh, you're not going to know if you're creating tombstones until you start going through your application regular cycles. Uh, you're not going to know if maybe you should change your GC gray second period because you need to evict your tombstones faster. Um, and run it, you know, run it for a few hours. Make sure compaction is running. Make sure you're triggering garbage collection. Make sure you're going through, you know, hopefully you have repair services turned on, right? Make sure your repairs are running. Uh, continuously monitor your your environment. Take a look at you know Cassandra system log, but then also take a look like at your GC log, right? You can set your uh, one of your JVM flags to actually write to a GC log and then monitor your log, right? Take a look to see uh, how often you're doing garbage collection, how long is it taking, is there any um, the optimization happening? Just monitor your environment. And then uh, the last one is, you know, as I mentioned, there's different garbage collectors out there. Uh, yeah, uh, Shenandoah, CGC, they're, they're GA, right? So uh, I think Shenandoah was, was released in Java 12 and it got backported to Java 8 and Java 11. Uh, ZGC is in um, Java 15, so it's a little newer, but, um, you know, take a look. Zing has been around since Java 7. CMS has been around forever, clearly, and so has G1. Um, so you have options. And that's all I have. Um, let me see what other questions. Uh, which coverage collector is suitable for particular workloads? Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually really going to depend of, you know, are you uh, really, um, like, are you conscious about latency and you can have slightly lower throughput, then, you know, maybe take a look at Shenandoah. Uh, I'm not a data science anymore, so I'm totally not plugging it, but uh, they just did a benchmark that was kind of interesting about, it was actually very interesting, because uh, it also compares uh, Cassandra 3.11 with Cassandra 4.0 and then different garbage collectors and different Java versions, right? And so um, take a look at their, their results. They, can sh they show both uh, what's the fastest throughput they got with the different garbage collectors as well as what was the, lane, the best latency they got. So cool. Um, I think I'm out of time, but uh, 
yeah, thanks a lot. Hope, uh, hope it was helpful. <laughs>